So over the last six months we have covered both Bioshock 1, 2 and all of the DLC that they have. And finally folks, it is time for the final game of the trilogy, Bioshock Infinite. Infinite swaps the well known and loved Rapture for a journey through the clouds of Columbia instead. And with 50 achievements up for grabs in the base game, it's time to start as we have a lot of work to do. So make sure that you subscribe for more achievement grinds as it really does help the channel out and we are getting scarily close to 100,000 subs. However, with that, let's begin. Welcome to the achievement grind. Now, since we have to go through this game twice, the first playthrough is going to be on easy so that we can collect every miscellaneous achievement before we go through the again on the hardest difficulty, 1999 mode. The game begins in 1912 on the coast of Maine. Two George looking gits are taking us somewhere and as a thanks for using wet boat travels, we get a box with a code, a gun and a key. Interesting. We arrive at the dock and part ways with this bickering couple as we have been brought to a lighthouse. A pinned note to the door says that we have to find the girl and wipe away the debt. Sounds good. So we go to climb the lighthouse immediately passing dead bodies on the way which is always riveting. Then ringing in the bells at the top in the same way that it shows us on the card, the sky bends red and the door opens to reveal a gaming chair. And to be honest we could do with quite the sit down. Those ladders had a lot of steps you know. So we take a seat and we instantly regret this decision as we are locked in place. Within seconds the chair turns into a rocket that reveals the location of this game. Columbia. Now, Columbia was designed to be a symbol of American political and religious ideals, separated and isolated from the rest of humanity. But as you'll see, the regime is just based on white supremacy, which can make things a little odd and pretty uncomfortable later on. During our first scenic look at Columbia, we also unlock our first achievement written in the clouds, before the rocket docks and we go to explore this stunning setting for the first time. We start our trek in Columbia by going through a church, however to gain access to the meat and potatoes of the city, we must be baptised as our sins must be cleansed before we are allowed in, so we unfortunately accept the bath. During the cleansing, we then seem to drown, and we're thrown back to Booker DeWitt's office in New York, with DeWitt being the main character that we play as. We open the door to New York on fire with a looming Columbia looking over it, but within seconds we wake up back in Columbia. Now honestly, first impression, the setting is absolutely beautiful. I can imagine it was a risk to design a Bioshock game that wasn't in Rapture, however they have once again knocked out of the park visually with the look so we steal a hot dog and get on our way. Now, throughout the game, there are several collectibles that we need as well. Voxophones, which are the same as the audio diaries from the previous games, and we also need to view these kinetoscopes and telescopes for another, so we'll be going through these throughout. We walk past flower salesmen, robo-horses, and even a heavenly choir, until we reach a carnival of sorts that show off the incredible vigors, which are this game's version of plasmids, granting amazing powers to those that use them. The first we are given for free is Possession, the ability to control robots, humans, and everything in between, and we use said power to open the door further throughout. However, we would go through if it weren't for these two weirdos asking me to say heads or tails, apparently heads being the clear choice that we should have picked. Anyway, I doubt we'll see those two again. On the way through, we also see a poster saying that somebody called the False Shepherd will come to Columbia bearing a D on his right hand. And what are the chances we have that as a tattoo? What a coincidence! But apparently this False Shepherd is the bringer of the end of days, which does sound quite fun. Anyway, with the carnival gone past, we soon have our next event, a raffle. We pick a ball with a number on it and seconds later that very number is picked and we have won a prize. Now, right, uh, the prize is, um, uh, the prize is a chance to throw a baseball at an interracial couple. Yeah, I told you, it can get pretty weird and uncomfortable, but since we're not a gigantic stinking piece of shit, we just throw the ball at the announcer instead. Or we go to, as right before the ball leaves our hand, the Rosas grab us, as they have seen the tattoo on our hand, and now know us as the snake in the grass false shepherd. But before we can be arrested, we use one of the officer's skyhooks and a baseball distraction to break free and begin our quest of death. We take the skyhook for ourselves. Now, the actual skyhook allows us to grind rails that can at Columbia together, but they also do double as a rather handy punching device. So time to run through Columbia to lose the police and hopefully get closer to the girl that will wipe away the debt. This is when we meet the next enemy, the fireman. This rather angry gent has the ability of devil's kiss and well, yeah, he's a tough son of a bitch, but not tough enough as we soon riddle him with bullets and steal his fire vigor for our own. We then enter a building and in here we have our next achievement, as on the table are a ton of DLC items and gear that you can equip. There are four slots for four clothing choices and 
and each grant different abilities, such as the hat to heal on melee hits or some shoes that let you run faster, for example. But for equipping a full set of dapper gear items, we unlocked Dressed for Success. We carry on shooting and skyhooking the enemies to death that are in our path, and here we also get our next achievement as well when we use the skyhook to execute 20 enemies, unlocking Industrial Accident. Now, honestly, these sections don't really have much to them. It's basically just to get you ready for the movement, for the vigors and the combat that you'll have to get used to throughout the game. So we can run through this section quite quickly. Also unlocking our next achievement for killing 25 enemies with a pistol, unlocking a real pistol. Also got to apologize for the ugly UI on this one, folks. For some reason, this game just has pop-ups on the achievement progress all the damn time. And it's annoying, but there's nothing I can do about it. Anyway, here we also meet a new enemy, the Crow Diddler. Guess it's all Crover for him. He has a murder of crows as his vigor, and he is able to teleport with them as well. However, he can't crow his way out of these bullets, so we kill him and steal his pigeon juice for ourselves. Now, one of the really cool things that you can do with the vigors is to make traps by holding down the button, a really good way of dealing with enemies that aren't looking where they're going. And by luring three enemies into said traps five times, you guessed it, we unlocked more for your money. However, it's time to head to Monument Island, where apparently the girl is located. There is certainly a couple of fights on the way, but nothing that we can't handle, and soon we find the ride to go directly there. As we do, a man tells everybody to stand down and to let us through. The man who gave the command is the Prophet Comstock. This is the man in charge and the reason why Columbia is the way that it is, and he knows exactly who we are and why we are here. We're here to wipe away the debt. Since we tell him to go and screw himself though, the officers resort back to violence. We then fight our way on board Comstock's airship, but when it's about to go down, we skyline our way to the entrance of Monument Island, and somehow it worked perfectly and we're there. We have arrived and we also unlock Welcome to Monument Island. Now, Monument Island is a couple of things to Columbia, but what we need it for is to use it to get to Monument Tower, which is where the girl is. When we reach there, we find the girl as we go through rooms and rooms of peeping windows. It is odd, but the girl does seem clueless that these mirrors are too. Way. This is Elizabeth, the woman that we need to grab. And as you'll come to see, she is quite talented uh, and obsessed with Paris. She's so obsessed she's got to go there straight away. However, whilst trying to reach her, we take a wrong step and plummet to the floor, which I guess is a way to greet her. She threatens us with books, but we say that we are here to save her from the tower. But something's coming after us, and we don't want to know what it is. So we use the key that we were given on the boat to unlock the vault door and start our escape. Now, we don't see what's attacking right away, only snippets really, but it's big so we need to move and quickly. We reach the top of Monument Tower and somehow manage to skyhook onto a rail, also seeing glimpses of the creature that was attacking us, and it must be beefy because it has completely destroyed the tower. This is the Songbird. It's big, it's scary, and it doesn't like water, as the pressure gives it a little headache. However, we once again drown and wake up on a beach with Liz giving us CPR. Honestly, we have a bit of a bad habit in drowning in this game, don't we? However, having saved our life, Liz goes to have a dance as this is the first time that she has ever been out of the tower. We, being the party pooper that we are though, immediately get her to stop with the offer of taking her to Paris instead through the First Lady airship. She's a gullible fucker and takes the bait. On the way, we also bump into these two freaks again, who's this time ask us to pick a brooch out for Liz to wear. The bed or the cage? Well, considering we've just busted Liz out of a cage, we'll choose the bed and just move on. Now, sometime later, a locked door is blocking us. However, Liz's years of reading books have made her the perfect person to pick the lock, and this is something that we can now do with locked doors as long as we have the right amount of picks. Now, at the desk to buy tickets for the airship, the dude behind the counter is giving us a bad vibe as he sketchily is talking to somebody. We take this as a sign to shoot him in the face as ignoring a customer is just plain bad manners. But it turns out that everybody in this section is an agent, so we unleash hell. Unfortunately though, Elizabeth runs away whilst we're fighting. We do find her eventually though, and even though she is absolutely freaked out, she understands that we had no choice. Time to find another way off this floating city. Unfortunately, the way forward is blocked by a lack of electricity though, and we will need a new vigor to push our way through. So we need to go to the Hall of Heroes to find it. On the way down, Liz also shows her powers more. She calls them tears, and they are basically windows into other worlds. Most aren't really anything special, but some are incredibly different. When we leave the lift, we also get our next achievement as well for using the Skyhook to perform 20 Skyline Strike Kills, and by doing so, we get Aerial Assassin. Now, in here, we find a different Vigor first called Booking Bronco, which gives us the ability to launch enemies into the 
yeah, which is quite a fun one. A man then speaks to us over the intercom. This is Slade, and he is one of Comstock's biggest supporters. He has an army of men ready to die in glorious battle, so we give them their requests and quickly kill them in spectacular fashion, also unlocking the achievement for 20 RPG kills, Master of Pyrotechnics. Now, Slade is avoiding us really well, even upping the enemies he sends to motorised patriots that can shred you with miniguns and definitely take a bullet or two. But when we find the room full of shock jockey and notice that every single one of them is empty, we now definitely need to find Slade and to take his. However, folks, before we do, we have another achievement, as the next is for killing five enemies whilst they are falling. And with booking Bronco, this is easy as hell. Just wait for them to start falling and shoot their brains apart. On the fifth time we did this, we unlocked Skeet Shoot. We did it so well, in fact, that we unlocked it twice. I am good. My God, I'm good. But enough of this messing around. It's time to wrap this up. We soon find Slade on the floor injured, but he is not dead. He actually wants to be soon though, and wants a warrior's death. We grant it and shoot him in the dome before we take his shock jockey for ourselves, also unlocking another achievement, Shock Tactics. Time to go and power the gondola and move on through. On the way, we also pick up two more achievements. The first is for getting 50 kills with a shotgun, unlocking Street Sweeper, and by looting 200 different containers, we also unlocked coins in the cushions. Now back to the gondola. We we do indeed power it up thanks to our new ability, and after dealing with the wave of enemies Comstock once again sends our way, we push them out and board the airship before setting off on it and unlocking first class ticket. Unfortunately though, Elizabeth sees through our ruse of promising Paris, as she notices the coordinates realising that we're not going to Paris, we're honest and just says that she's a means to pay off our debt, and she doesn't like that very much. Oh damn, yeah, she really doesn't like us anymore. Once again, we regain consciousness at Finkton Docks. Elizabeth has docked the airship and ran off, but when we fully wake up again, we see the Vox Populi, who re-knock us out again. The Vox Populi are a militant insurgency group, taking on Comstock for his xenophobic and racist ideology, who are led by Daisy Fitzroy, who we then meet. She says that she needs a favour for a favour. We need to get her enough guns to arm her army, and in return, we'll get the airship back. They let us go, and we have a new plan. Elizabeth? and guns. Walking through, it's more of the same, fighting our way through wave and wave of enemies trying to get closer to our goal. And later on, when we find Elizabeth again, we chase after her, and she uses every tear that she can to slow us down, until a rather beefy person helps her and scares the heck out of me. This is a handyman, the big daddy replacement of Columbia, and they do indeed pack a punch. But fortunately, this one only wants us to fall to our death instead. We do almost indeed die before thankfully Liz helps us out and we call a truce for now. The mission is just to simply find somebody who can supply guns to Daisy. No easy feat, I'm sure, in this place. However, in our next fight, we also no-scope our way to 30 sniper kills and unlock the achievement on a clean day. Eventually, we do indeed get the name of a man who can help us, Chen Lin, a local gunsmith who actually has a shop in the area. So let's go make an impression. Oh, maybe we can't, as when we find his shop, the entire place has been looted, and we find his wife crying at a mural saying that Chen Lin has been taken by the police. Time for a rescue mission, methinks. Now, remember the handyman I mentioned earlier? Well, it's actually time to fight him now, as here is where we're going for our next achievement. As in the middle of this hulking creature, as you can no doubt see, he has a little heart in a jar. Now, all we need to do is kill the handyman by only shooting said heart. Definitely one of the harder and trickier achievements in the game, however if you're patient and with the right gear and weapons, it isn't actually too bad. We in fact took him down and unlocked it on our first try, gaining Heartbreaker. Now we find out that Chen Lin's been held in a prison cell below one of Finks' buildings, so we need to break in to get to him. Again, nothing really happens outside of the usual, except we do have another achievement here. This one is for using these infusions to fully level one of the skill trees, either health, shields or salts. It's it's another collectible type really, but by maxing out our health, we unlock Raising the Bar. After dealing with Finks' men, we eventually find Chen, and he is looking a touch worse for wear. Christ, yeah he is. If only two people were to appear as if from nowhere and help. Oh, hello, these pricks. They both say that we need to change our perspective, as even though Chen Lin is dead in this timeline, Elizabeth can rift us through to another universe in which he isn't dead and get the guns there. Simple, I guess, so let's go. Only problem is, though, that if we use a tear, we won't be able to return to this universe. But this version sucks anyway, let's just try a new one. By leaving the cell room and fighting more policemen officers, we get another couple of achievements as well. The first is for killing 70 
25 enemies under the effects of Vigors, easily done and we unlock Vigorous Opposition, then soon followed by 100 kills with the Carbine, unlocking us Big Game Hunter. When we go back to Chen's workshop and find his wife again, she says that his tools have been stolen in this universe and Chen is not happy that he cannot wear, so now we need to go and get his tools. To the shanty town we go apparently. Over all of this, Booker and Elizabeth have also been getting closer and learning more about each other's lives and such, but we soon put that to an end and arrive in shanty town. We accidentally start a fight with all of the residents however, which isn't exactly wonderful, I get it, although it does lead to a wonderful thing, our next achievement. As when we get drunk on free wine and vodka and then unload into all of these patrons minding their own business, when we kill five we unlock Lost Weekend. We also find a friend. <laughs> anyway, rap maiming aside, we have work to do, so we carry on, and you'll be shocked to know folks that we've got some more achievements as well, as when we are fighting further through, we get 25 kills with a hand cannon and unlock loose cannon, and by killing our 20th heavy hitter enemy, we also unlock David and Goliath. Well, we're not done yet though folks, because when we get our 30th kill with the volley gun, we also unlock here little piggy. But once we're done fighting, we go into the basement of a police station, and through another rift, we see that this place has mother loads upon mother loads of guns. Enough guns for Daisy's army three times over, so Elizabeth rips open a tear and we step into that universe. When we do, we also unlock the next achievement as well, Armed Revolt. Not bad progress at all. Honestly, Bioshock Infinite's achievements aren't too bad yet, just a lot of particular kills with guns and vigors and such, so let's continue. When we leave the building in this universe, the Vox are doing really well, and already fighting back again Comstock's shitty regime. And you're gonna be amazed folks, another achievement is here as well, as when we ride the skylines we get our fifth headshot on them and unlock bolt from the blue. With the help of the Vox Populi, we quickly sprint and shoot our way past the enemies, as we've done so many times before. Also learning that in this universe, Booker DeWitt is a hero of the Vox, as we were the leader of them. I think it's time for a new vigor though, however, Charge. This one allows you to supercharge the Skyhook and basically rip people apart with it. However, it is definitely the weakest vigor in the game, and one I definitely use the least. But it is what it is, on to better news. Like another achievement maybe? As just moments after this, we continue the mayhem and violence and we get Elizabeth to open the 30th tear in the game and when we do so we unlock tear him a new one and honestly it's so amazing to have a Bioshock game that finally put some effort into the achievement names I'm so bloody proud now unfortunately in this universe Chen Lin and his wife have been killed so with everything constantly going wrong and me fed up to hell of me trying to find Chen Lin or his guns or his tools we decide to just go get our airship back and to get the hell out of here on the path as well folks you guessed it there's another achievement as we get 30 he kills with the crank gun that you get off fallen patriots and we unlock season to taste delicious now we do more of the same, fighting through waves of Comstock police whilst trying to grind weapon achievements. However, we're getting really close to the First Lady airship. However, on the lift up, we have a problem. Daisy gets in touch to say that we are not the Booker DeWitt that she knows, as we actually died in this universe. So the Vox Populi are now enemies as well. How fun! But who cares about that as it's time to get the best vigor in the game, Undertow. This one allows you to simply move people out of the way with water and it's hilarious and quite strong on a map with a ton of falling hazards. After that we see Daisy as she starts her villain arc and we need to put a stop to her before she kills everyone. Now during another fight with the Vox we get our next achievement for getting every vigor combination together in the game. An easy one once you've got the vigors in question and once done you unlock combination shock. However by now Daisy is about to end a child and we cannot stand that so we help Elizabeth into the ducks and she takes out Daisy with a pair of scissors. She is incredibly shook up as you'd imagine. However we manage to make it to the airship. Elizabeth immediately runs off to tend to her wounds, so we set off on the airship and unlock yet another achievement, Working Class Hero. Now it turns out that Elizabeth was giving herself a dope fade, and a new look to suit her killing mentality. However, with a tune filling the air, the songbed comes back and immediately destroys the airship. When we wake up, the two assholes from earlier are here playing a piano. They give us a card with a songbed's defense system on it, and apparently the tune to summon it, as you have to do it in a particular way. But more on that later, as for now, we we need to get to Comstock's house. You know the drill folks, it's time for killing more waves and waves of nameless NPCs and the next achievement we get is for getting 10 environment kills. Easy to do if you just tear open an arc pylon and let it electrocute everybody to death and by doing so we unlock Hazard Pay. Now we find out on the way further throughout that the two people turning up are the Latest twins and they're the ones who developed the technology that allowed Columbia to be in the clouds. What they're doing with us though? No idea. Now folks, since it's just more of the same, let's just burn through the achievements 
achievements that we unlocked on the way. The next was for having one fully upgraded gun and one fully upgraded vigor at the same time. Once bought and unlocked, we get kitted out. After that, we collected every infusion in the game as well, and with a final shield upgrade, unlocked infused with greatness. Now, next, we found the last figure in the game called Return to Sender, which allows you to kind of absorb bullets and, you guessed it, fire them right back at the attackers. And by using every vigor in the game on an enemy, we also unlocked Well Rounded. The next was for Elizabeth's hard work as well, as by now we had been using her to pick 30 locks in the game, and when she sprang the last one open, we unlocked the roguish type. Now, when we reach Comstock's house, Elizabeth's handprint doesn't work on the door, so our phenomenal idea is to go and loot her mum's grave for her hand, and use that instead, for some reason. Now when we make it to the graveyard, Elizabeth has some sassy quips for her mum, but then we open the coffin ready to steal ourselves some fingers. Comstock then gets in touch saying that Elizabeth has been led astray, and for some reason, Elizabeth then freaks out, and if that wasn't odd enough, the ghost of her mother then appears, and we now need to kill her for her hand. Now, in all honesty, I think this part is absolutely stupid. There is a lot in Bioshock that stretches the imagination, but I just really don't see ghosts fitting into this game. It just feels a little bit weird to me. However, with a very nice explosive weapon, we kill the aspect of her mother and only need to do it a couple more times now. So we travel the map looking for the other renditions of her mother and taking them out. Now, even though there isn't anything really here to say other than the ghost murder, we do get some more achievements, of course. The first is for 150 kills with a machine gun. Definitely one of the longer weapon related achievements however once done we unlocked passionately reciprocated and during another fight with elizabeth's mother we go and spend some more money in the dollar bill and vigor machines and when our total spending reaches ten thousand dollars we unlock grand largesse i think that's how you pronounce it anyway now, throughout the many fights with dear old mother, it turns out that she wasn't the monster that Elizabeth thought that she was. In fact, she was just another victim of Comstock. So, on the final fight outside the house, instead of violence, it ends with understanding and apologies. Aw, oh, that's nice. The ghost is like, bloody thanks, love. I appreciate that. Here, let me get that door for you. And then the ghost of the mother just absolutely obliterates the door, and we're free to carry on. Also unlocking the next achievement, Blood in the Streets. Now, time for Comstock's house. This part of the level starts with a songbird appearing once again, throwing us straight into the building and taking Elizabeth back. So once again, we have to bloody save Elizabeth. Good lord, I can't wait to get this over with and wipe away that bastard debt. Now inside Comstock's house, we meet a new enemy, the Boys of Silence. These hilarious looking gits survey the area and if you disturb them, they will send an army of twisted freaks your way. It can get quite tense for sure as we make our way further into the house, trying to avoid their gazes. We head to the top of the house to open a switch in the security office that will allow us to now reach Elizabeth. And we also get the absolute shock of our lives by a sneaky bastard boy of silence. What a prick. However, when we make it downstairs, we then hear the voice of Elizabeth. Only she's in a shadow and speaking quite oddly. She gives us a hand up and it's revealed that this Liz is now an old git. She shows us the future of Comstock raining fire on New York, but this version of Elizabeth is far too gone and far too old to be seen with us. So she gives us a code that we'll have to give the new Elizabeth that we're about to save. Honestly, yes, this can get pretty confusing, but it is what it is. I am trying to sum this up as best as I can. We soon find Elizabeth then hooked up to some machines that look rather painful, so we take a quick five minutes to kill her captors and free her from her confinements. When we do, she gets back her power and destroys everybody in the room with her. We find her, we free her, and take a rather horrible needle out of her spine. But finally, we have a way past Songbird, once this version of Elizabeth decrypts the message. But instead of fleeing Columbia and just running away, Elizabeth now wants to end Comstock and put an end to all of this. And honestly, it is a decent plan, so let's get to it. And by by freeing Elizabeth, we also unlock the next achievement, Higher Learning. On the way out, we find Comstock's flagship and decide that getting on there is the best bet to start to take out Comstock. So we fight through all of the enemies that of course litter the path in between. And at the end, we also find our final telescope. We stick our bead little eyes into it and unlock Sightseer. Collectible achievements like this always make me nervous. However, we still have a couple of audio diaries left to go. After that, we steal a police tram thingy and then go to chase down the flagship. Of course, more fights are inevitable. However, since we're fighting on very very tiny platforms right above the clouds, the undertow vigor here works a charm and we soon water all of the enemies off the ships, and doing so unlock the next achievement, Bonfoyage, for knocking 20 enemies to their deaths. Also doing it so well again, we unlock it twice.
twice. Now, during the fight, they also send mosquitoes to attack us. However, with possession, they now work for me. And when they reach a couple of kills each, we reach 20 total using possessed machines and unlock the next achievement as well, Mind Over Matter. Finally, after many minutes of sending random goons to their deaths, we reach Comstock's ship and go to take over it, going up level by level overrunning this very impressive vessel. And big surprise here, folks, we have a couple more achievements. The next we got was for simply getting 30 total kills while riding Skylines. Honestly, a little surprised it taken me this long, however, we do it easily and unlock on the fly. And a couple of minutes after that, we also find the last Voxophone, and with every audio diary thankfully collected, we also gain the achievement Eavesdropper. And my lord, I was so happy to get that. As I said, collectible achievements like this give me the fear. But at long last, we reach the top of the ship, and we are moments away from Comstock. We also find out here that the tower that Elizabeth was in was actually making her powers weaker, as originally she used to be able to create tears from memory. But enough of that, it's time to deal with Comstock. He starts sponging Elizabeth, saying that all he's doing is protecting her from me, the false shepherd. He then talks to us saying that he has rained hell just to keep Elizabeth safe, but then Comstock tells Liz to ask us about her finger. For those of you that don't know, Elizabeth has lost her pinky finger and now wears a thimble on it instead, and has no idea why. He gets quite handsy with her, so we take out all of the frustration on Liz's dad and give him a rather long and extensive drinking session. And with that, Comstock is dead. Liz freaks out about her finger, but since we haven't a clue, we just move on. When we reach the control room, we're about to be attacked viciously, but then it clicks. Elizabeth figures out the riddle and knows how to summon the songbird, but for our benefit this time. The plan works and the songbird is now ours to control. Oh yeah, things are about to get wicked. And honestly, this is the biggest fight on our hands, so thankfully we do have a powerful bird to help. And honestly, being able to call in the songbird whilst we defend the ship is so much fun. A really decent fight to end on. However, after about 10 minutes of fighting and like all good things, it comes to an end. When it does, we meet Elizabeth at the end of the ship and unlock the achievement the bird of the cage. Our final act with the songbird is to get it to fully destroy the tower and hopefully get Elizabeth's full power back. It works a treat, but unfortunately the bird then goes rogue. Elizabeth decides with full power to take out the songbird once and for all, and she does so by returning us to a familiar and well-loved place. We are back in Rapture, and since we are extremely under the water, the songbird very quickly dies due to the pressure. Poor bird. I never thought I'd feel this sad over a bird. However, it's time to end this now, folks, and piece everything together. We travel through Rapture, and honestly, I think they should set a game or two here. It is a rather stunning location. However, we soon rise to the surface and reach the infamous lighthouse from the first game. We unlock the door and walk through to see a million other lighthouses scattered throughout the ocean. Every lighthouse represents another door and another universe. And in every universe, there is always a man, there is always a lighthouse, and there is always a city. We travel through the multiverse for a little bit, but eventually we reach another baptism. Unlike the first though, we don't go through with it and instead run away. Booker says let's just open a tear to Paris and end all of this, but Liz says that we can't because Comstock isn't dead, even though we had just killed him. We walk through the door and we're back in Booker's office from New York. It turns out that Latouse is the one who hired us to bring him the girl and wipe away the debt. However, we now have a baby in the room. This is apparently the girl to wipe away the debt, so we pick up our own child and hand her to Latouse. Next, we appear on the boat again, and it turns out that the two George-looking gits from the start are the Latouse twins again, and through the next store we see the deal, one of us giving Comstock our child. We have second doubts but Comstock still gets to her, and Elizabeth loses her finger in the process when the portal closes. We then go back to being baptised, ready to be born again before multiple versions of Elizabeth appear. Apparently, Booker is Comstock. If Booker ran away from the baptism, he stayed as Booker, and if he took the baptism, he became Comstock. So these Elizabeths then decide to drown us, and that's Bioshock Infinite. The game ends as the camera pans away from the Elizabeths that have just drowned us. We also unlocked the achievement for completing the campaign on Easy Tin Soldier and showed old acquaintance for unlocking 1999 mode. Now, honestly, the campaign for Bioshock Infinite, in my opinion, isn't the best. It is extremely convoluted, and the moment you bring in multiple universes and such, it just gets super messy. I've honestly tried to sum up the campaign as best as I can, but honestly, I still don't fully understand it, even after watching an ending explained vid. It's decent and fun, yes, but since Bioshock is known for the story and the twists, I feel like they thought that they had to go the extra mile for the third game. However, for me, it just didn't land. But that doesn't matter, as we now need to go through the entire game again on 1999 mode for the rest of the achievements, as well as picking up one that we didn't manage in the first playthrough. Now, 1999 mode is essentially the hardest difficulty in the game. However, money is the most important thing here, as every time you die, you lose $100. If you run out of money and die, you must restart the entire campaign again. There is
is also another achievement for not using a single dollar bill machine during this mode, so we'll be going for that as well. Now, honestly, folks, I would love to say that this was hard and terrible, but honestly, it really wasn't. We quickly got the achievement we missed in the first playthrough for killing 20 enemies with allies brought in through tears, unlocking strange bedfellows. However, with patience and a little bit of planning, 1999 mode isn't that hard, and if you scavenge, you will have plenty of money to warrant any deaths that you have. So there isn't anything really to talk about here, except for the fight with your mother. I'm gonna die again and she's just gonna go back to full health? I don't understand. I don't understand how the hell you're meant to do this. It doesn't give you any ammo, any salts, and the ones that it do run out because everything's tanky as shit. <laughs> I'm really not okay with this chat. They are so f***ing tanky! Oh, fucking... What am I meant to do? This isn't winnable. This genuinely isn't winnable. Now, the ghost fight with Lady Comstock is without question the hardest part of the game. As the damage you take is insane, there is an infinite number of enemies spawning as the ghost revives the dead soldiers around, and every time you die you lose money and your resources get less and less while the enemies go back to full health. This part was honestly infuriating. Like, I cannot remember the last time I was moulding this hard. It is just brutally unfair and really not well programmed. However, we found a cheesy way to beat her. Instead of just trying to shoot her to death before the fight starts, just lion hair spawn spot with as many fire traps as you can muster, and watch her die fast. If it wasn't for this cheesy method of killing her, the game honestly wouldn't be doable in my eyes. It is honestly ridiculous and that hard. But after a couple of hours and the cheesy method of winning, we got past it and was soon at the end of the game once again. As I said folks, 1999 mode isn't the hardest out there, and I can imagine that most of you will be able to do this relatively easily. Even not using the dollar bill machines didn't impose too much, as if you're scavenging enough, you will all always have what you need. So we once again reach the end of the game and when Elizabeth drowns us we unlock the last achievements that we need. We unlock Saw the Elephant for completing on normal, Stone Cold Pinkerton for on hard, Old Lang Zai for 1999 mode and Scavenger Hunt for 1999 mode without using a single dollar bill machine. And with that folks the base game for Infinite is done. Honestly this is without question the weakest Bioshock in my opinion. I know a lot of people have a lot of love for this game but for me it just misses the mark as a Bioshock. Don't get me wrong the gameplay is fun and I was never bored, but the story is messy, they changed a lot of the mechanics that I loved about the first two, and it just didn't scratch that Bioshock itch for me. However, I will talk more about this later in the second video where we wrap this baby up with those bastard blue ribbons. However, for now folks, the grind is over. Now, as I said, Bioshock Infinite to me is a good game, but it's just not a good Bioshock. But with three more DLCs to tackle in the future, that may change. And of course, folks, I'll be doing my little review and stats at the end of the DLC video that will hopefully be out in the next couple of weeks. For now, though, folks, please just like and subscribe as next week we are swinging into the Spider-Man games. With Spider-Man 2 just around the corner and me buying a PS5 specifically for it, I thought it was best to get the previous games covered as well. So next week is Spider-Man. How will the grind fare as we swing from buildings, punch bad guys, in the face and everything in between. Well, find out next Sunday. Also need to say a massive thanks again to my Patreon followers, with a super special thanks to Loki Mischief, Marmaseeks, Lord KT, Desti, Marental, Pick Prince, Tyro Flack Ripper, Cash, Cobble, The Wolverine Cool 23, Henry, Inductive Gaming, Lyder, A Jaffa Boyo, Danny Doug, Luna Git Good, Sean the Sheep, Ash Thomas, and Nuki. You folks are the goats and thank you all so so much. Also, folks, don't forget to swing by my Twitch as well, where we go for the achievement grinds live, and on the 14th, the race to be the first person to platinum Mortal Kombat 1 begins, so it would be lovely to have you there for that. But that's it from me today, you amazing lot. Thank you all so much for watching, I really hope you enjoyed the video, and as I said, it's a very convoluted campaign, but I hopefully I summed it up as best as I could, and hopefully see you all next week. So everybody, take care, bye-bye for now.